I think we'll get going. Um, I'm excited today to welcome Juliana Schroeder to our summer series. Um, I've known Juliana's work for a long time. Um, all through that time, I've always been consistently impressed with how uh, amazing it is. Juliana's work um, focuses on dehumanization and humanization and, and communication and is really the kind of like does groundbreaking work on how in political polarization that those two things are actually powerfully linked, even though we might not think so. And uh, her work kind of pushes the theoretical envelope of the fact that they are linked and, and practically important, like how can we overcome the miscommunication and dehumanization that characterizes uh, modern political polarization. So we're super excited to have her here today, very lucky. And um, yeah, take it away, Juliana. Thank you so much, Kurt. I'm, I'm so excited to be here uh, today with all of you. And I'm gonna share some new work. And um, let me just take a minute to pop out the chat so I can see any chats that people send me and look at your participants. So you can raise a virtual hand if you want. Um, so hopefully everyone can see my screen now. And I will be talking about what we are calling everyday dehumanization, uh, showing some, some evidence for this. And so let me go ahead and start with a quote that probably all of you heard of from Aristotle. So most people know the first line, uh, man you know, and woman, of course, uh, are by nature social animals. And then I like the way this quote continues. It says, anyone who does not partake of society is either a beast or a god. All right, so kind of suggesting that socializing is, is a, a kind of a fundamentally human thing that we do. And um, just this little note at the bottom, the, the psychology and the empirical research on this has um, really shown that yes, having strong social networks um, that is associated with being happy, healthy, and wealthy. All right, and so I'm not going to run you through all of the research because this is not supposed to be a super long talk. But let me just show you, you know, one study that I like that um, indicates that socializing is associated with more happiness. And so this is a study um, conducted with uh, actually uh, participants in Texas doing um, experience sampling. So on their phone. Um, they would get, you know, a text message saying, um, stop whatever you're doing and answer some questions. And it would ask, what are you doing right now? What activity are you engaged in? And then how much positive affect do you feel and how much negative affect do you feel? And then over the course of two weeks, they aggregate this data. And then I'm showing you the means here in the graph. And so it's ordered by positive affect. And so if you look at the activities that brought the most, you know, positive affect, well, so the one at the very top is, you know, intimate relations. So I suppose sex is, is really the best. But right under that is, is socializing. Um, and so uh, that's you know, certainly producing high positive affect more so than any other thing. And then if you look at the interaction partners that people were with, and what you can see is that interacting with, with anyone, even your boss, uh, does lead people to report greater positive affect than being alone by themselves. All right, but what we wondered was, you know, is this really true all the time? I mean, we can probably think of times when socializing maybe didn't bring us a maximum happiness or when we just don't want to socialize. And so the, the context I want to draw, bring your attention to is in um, uh, any context when you're, you know, surrounded by strangers and you, you choose not to engage with them. And so you could think of being in public transportation, like a subway car. Um, I think our world is coming back to this again. So, so this, these, these situations will be happening again. And um, you know, it's been well known in psychology. So if you look at a seminal chapter about social life from Milgram and Sabini back in 1978, that um, social behavior, let's just say on the subway, uh, has implicit rules. And one of those rules that was noted in this particular chapter is that passengers are discouraged from talking to one another even riders squeezed into close proximity are rarely observed to converse. And so, you know, we wondered, you know, is it possible that even socializing with strangers, kind of conservative test, can lead to happiness and that people might not be realizing this or might not be engaging and might be some psychological barriers in place there. And so we ran some experiments to test this idea. So this was way back in 2014 uh, at the University of Chicago. And so um, we did it on trains, buses, uh, we've now done it on planes, we've done it in cabs, um, but I'm just going to show you one initial experiment that we ran on commuter trains. And um, basically what we did is um, we went um, on these computer trains, we went out to the suburbs of Chicago, we went to the Homewood um, Metro Station, which is way out, that's actually where Nick Epley, who does the research with me, lives. And we got commuters going downtown to Millennium Station to participate in a study. 
And so we, we were out here, they're going downtown into Chicago, and this is what the inside of those trains look like, um, which is, you know, essentially nobody really tends to talk to each other on these trains. Um, and so what we do is we stand in the stairwell of the trains with a poster that looks exactly like this. You can see uh, what we looked like when we ran this study. And we just stop um, passengers who are coming by and say, hey, do you want a Starbucks gift card uh, to be part of a study today? And so if people said yes, then they said, okay, you have to sign these consent forms promising that you're gonna do what we tell you to do today. And then they would, we would randomly assign them into one of three different experimental conditions. So we either tell them, so for the study today, you're going to just um, enjoy your solitude. So keep yourself, enjoy your solitude on the train today. Take the time to sit alone with your thoughts. Okay, or we told them in the control condition, don't make any changes to your normal commute, do as you would normally do. Or in the connection condition, so this is the key condition, and we said, please have a conversation with another person on the train today try to make a connection. And we only recruited people who are walking alone. So they, you know, they, they don't know anyone else. So they're talking to a stranger essentially here. Um, okay, and so uh, we then have them complete a survey after their commute uh, getting so that we can understand what their experiences were in each of those three conditions. And the survey just asks some basic questions like what did you actually do on the train as a manipulation check to see if they did what we told them to do. Um, we ask um, critically about how positive overall was their commuting experience. So how pleasant was the commute and then their mood, how happy they felt and how sad they felt, which we reverse scored. Um, and they complete this immediately after the commute, by the way. We also wondered about um, whether there might be other costs to socialization. So you know, perhaps socialization does make people happy, but it reduces things like productivity. <laughs> and so we, we wanted to capture that you know, potential cost. So we asked about that. And then we had some other measures um, we, you know, we collected personality uh, variables, we asked about typical activities on the train, um, we collected demographics, and I'm happy to talk about those in questions if people have any later. And so, um, and I'll say that, you know, we actually did another thing here, which is that one set of participants didn't have to actually do anything, we just had them predict what it would be like to do those things. So still um, train commuters, so the same sample, but they just are predicting about it. All right, and so I'll show you the results on positivity. These are the predictions. And what you see is that these commuters are predicting that if they have to talk to someone, be in the connection condition, they will have a less positive commute than if they are in solitude or in the control condition, which I'm sure they're imagining just being in solitude. All right, now what happens when we actually make commuters engage in these behaviors? Um, what we see then is that the pattern looks completely different. So there actually people are reporting that they had the most positive commute surprisingly in the connection condition and the least in the solitude condition. All right, and then what about productivity? You might be wondering. So uh, again, people are predicting that in the connection condition, they will have the least productive commute by, by a long shot. Um, and then in reality, uh, we do actually don't see significant differences across the conditions um, across our study. So it doesn't really seem like it makes you know, that much of a difference. Okay. so. Um, you know, you might have a lot of questions about this. I'm happy to answer questions now if you have them or later on things like, you know, is it moderated by introversion or extroversion and, and so on. But, you know, you're, you're, you're happy to, you can ask those later, but I'm just going to tell you that we've replicated this finding many, many times. And one of the things that we've done now is um, we're, we're trying to go to different cultures. And so often when I give this talk, I'll get a comment like, yeah, maybe this worked in Chicago because people are pretty nice there, but it wouldn't work in fill in the blank, like New York or London or you know, some other curmudgeonly sample of participants. And so what we've been trying to do is you know, find these curmudgeonly samples across the world and just run, run the studies with them. And so um, the BBC actually reached out to us after our original paper was published and, and said, why don't we try this in London and see what happens in the tube stations? And so we said, yeah, let's, let's give it a shot. Um, and so we partnered with them and uh, we even had like buttons in the, con the co conversation condition um, that said tube chat, um, just kind of like remind people that they're in the conversation condition and get them to, to do it. And um, the nice thing is that we did indeed replicate the results <laughs> from what we found in Chicago. So, you know, even though people will tell us that it's not a very British thing to do to talk to strangers, we do find again that 
um, these participants felt um, more happy, had a more positive commute when they communicated than when they didn't. We wrote a little article about it for the BBC um, and it got a lot of comments and the comments really reflect that, um, you know, still we replicate the entire pattern. So people do still mispredict this. They don't think it'll make them happy. All right, and so rather than read you the comments and show you data, <laughs> what I'm going to show you instead is this really hilarious black market that popped up of anti-tube chat buttons. That And these were like people were making profits, like selling these on the side of the tube stations. <laughs> so they're pretty funny. They're kind of clever, like bugger off. Um, but yeah, so basically people do not think this will be a good experience for them. But when we force them to actually do it, they do. They do seem to have good experience. So. Um, what is the psychology of what is going on here? You know, why, why are people will, will controversially say mistakenly seeking solitude? You know, if they want to maximize their well-being, if they care about that, if they want to be happy, you know, why are they not wanting to engage with the stranger? Why do they think that'll make them unhappy? Um, and so, you know, we, we looked into a bunch of possible explanations for why this is. And one in particular that we found evidence for is that basically people don't know what other people want to do. They don't know if others want to engage with them. In fact, they think that others probably don't want to talk with them. All right. So and so they think it's gonna be really hard to start the conversation and they're likely to be socially rejected. So here's um, some questions we asked in a follow up survey. Um, how interested would you be to talk to someone else? And how interested would other people be to talk to you on a zero to six Likert scale? Um, and so what we find with these are with train and bus commuters is that basically people put themselves at kind of the midpoint of the scales and like, yeah, I might, I might be cautiously curious, but they everybody thinks everybody else is less interested in talking with them. And this predicts people's beliefs about their likelihood of being rejected if they try to talk to someone and their beliefs about um, how positive their experience will be if they try to have a conversation with someone. So people are really particularly concerned about that. And um, so I think this just taps into a much broader psychology. I'll just dive right into it, which is that, you know, we it's it's challenging to try to talk to a stranger because we don't know what other people are thinking. We don't know if they like us or they don't like us or they want to talk or they don't want to talk. We just can't read their minds. And so, you know, rather than our minds being sort of connected like these two strange people in this weird picture here, you know, we're disconnected. We have to make we have to go through this kind of inferential guesswork to figure out what other people are thinking. Like, is he making, is Kurt making eye contact with me right now? Is he not? Is he frowning? What's happening? And also I use state rights, so he looks very angry. Uh, so I also use stereotypes. I also use kind of the high level inputs like to, to make judgments about people. And so a lot of the social psychology is figuring out, you know, how do people make these assessments and judgments of others? And um, philosophers have thought about this for you know centuries and centuries. It's called the other minds problem. Um, and the kind of the philosophical version of this, um, at least the other minds problem, is that because here's how the logic goes: because I can't tell what you know Nick, let's say, is thinking. I don't really have direct access into his mind. I'm not experiencing it intimately myself. How do I even know that he has a mind? <laughs> How can I even be sure that he really has? I, I can only be sure that <laughs> I am the only mind that I can possibly know to exist. So that's solipsism. Um, and so, you know, th that's the kind of the thing that keeps philosophers up at night. It's not necessarily the thing that, you know, everyday humans really think, worry about, right? So in everyday life, we just walk around assuming other people have minds that are like somewhat like our own. We don't assume that they just don't have minds. Um, but what we have argued um, in a series of theory papers is that there is sort of a psychological remnant of the other minds problem, and that is what we call the lesser minds problem, which is essentially the idea that because we don't have this perfect introspective access into other minds, um, we tend to find them just other minds to be just a little less vivid, you know, we experience in them more weakly, and we kind of just make this, uh, this very subtle inference that other people often tend to have weaker mental capacities than we do ourselves. So, you know, the idea is that, you know, I'm here in my own mind, I can experience all my thoughts, my feelings, I know how, you know, nervous or whatever I am right now. And so those, those things are very salient to me. Um, but for others, I just don't really know, like, I'm not sure what Ramal is really kind of experiencing right now. And so, 
perhaps, you know, if I'm not thinking about it that carefully, I don't have, I'm not motivated to do so. I tend to just think, uh, well, she's, you know, who knows what she's really thinking. I'm not, I'm not thinking that she has particularly strong, vivid mental capacities. Okay. So um, we have also argued that this subtle inference that others have these lesser minds, um, which can be exacerbated under certain circumstances, is a, a subtle form of dehumanization. All right. And so there's all of this research, all of this literature that, um, and some of this Kurt Gray has done, uh, he's is certainly in this literature, that has looked at you know, what, what really are the kind of key attributes of, of humans and what, what's the perceptions of, of that. And so you can look at, you know, it maybe it's the, that humans have agency, they have experience, they have rationality, cognitive flexibility, and so on. Um, and so these literatures seem to really converge on this idea that um, the capacity for having you know, sophisticated thoughts and feelings, that's that, that mindfulness, that's a large part of what people perceive to be unique about humans. And so that's really implicated in humanness. And so if you think of other people as having these weaker mental capacities, that could be a, a subtle form of dehumanization. We're calling it everyday dehumanization, which that term might change, but that's, that's the term we're using right now. So, okay, so let me give you like a concrete example of what this actually means. What does everyday dehumanization look like? And so we wrote a paper um, recently on this in which we looked at perceptions of what motivates um, other people and oneself. What are others' needs and what are your own needs? And so we um, took this hierarchy that everybody knows, I'm sure you all are super familiar with it, Maslow's hierarchy. And um, we thought, you know, what's interesting about these different categories of needs, um, they vary on lots of dimensions, right? But one thing that's really interesting is that the lower level needs, like the physical needs, they're, they're biological, they're physical. Those are things that humans share with other non-human um, animals, right? So, you know, even, even a cockroach, <laughs> presumably needs to eat, needs to drink, a uh, chimpanzee, a human, right? So this kind of biological needs. But then the things up at the top, the self-actualization, the esteem needs, those are things that seem really related to mind and mental capacity. Like you wouldn't really think that an, another agent would have those needs unless they have like a mind. It, it, it's, it's a very psychological need, right? And so we thought, you know, okay, the top, the top level needs are kind of uniquely human needs are probably perceived as such. And then the lower level needs are these more animalistic um, needs. So, um, and we thought, you know, maybe people tend to categorize others as being at different levels of this hierarchy, right? So who do we think about in terms of other humans that might be at the bottom of the hierarchy? All right, so let me, um, you probably can think of who, who, you know, maybe not you yourself, but others maybe perceive at the bottom. And here's a quote that illustrates it. It says, in certain people, the level of aspiration may be permanently deadened or lowered. That is to say, the less prepotent goals may simply be lost and may disappear forever so that the person who has experienced life at a very low level, i.e. chronic unemployment, may continue to be satisfied for the rest of his life if only he can get enough food. All right, so this really is, is strong language saying these people, they, their levels of aspiration are deadened. They're stuck at the bottom of the hierarchy. Um, and, and so, you know, unemployed people, people that are, you know, hungry, for instance. And this quote is from Maslow, from the original Maslow paper. Um, we think of it as kind of a dehumanizing quote. Um, but, you know, that definitely fits with people's life perceptions, right? That, that homeless people are going to be at the bottom of the hierarchy. Now, who's at the top of the hierarchy? So who is it that's really, you know, striving to self-actualize? And who do we think really cares about that? Um, well, most people think that they themselves, um, if, if not, if they haven't quite made it to the top, they at least want to be at the top, right? It's something we care about. We do have those psychological needs. Okay, and so let me show you some data on people's perceptions rather than just giving you anecdotes. So we ran an experiment, we asked people to judge the needs of eight different agents. Okay, um, so this looks like a very random set, but actually these were theoretically determined. So we, we picked agents that the prior literature has shown tend to be highly humanized. So the self is, of course, all the work finds that people think of themselves as being very human. Um, a close friend, someone that you would know well, you would kind of know their mind. That would also be a, a highly humanized um, agent. Then we have kind of mixed stereotype. 
So lawyers are considered like highly competent, less warm. Uh, elderly people are tend to be considered, you know, more warm and less competent. And kids, obviously, warm but what not so competent. And then we have dehumanized um, agents. So those that prior research had shown um, tend to be seen as as less than human. And then of course a non-human comparison, uh, the chimpanzee. All right, and so we asked people for each of those different targets, how important are the following needs to them? And we asked about physiological needs, so eating, drinking, and sleeping, um, what we're calling middle level needs. These are the safety and belonging levels. So to, how important is it to feel safe, to feel loved, and so on? And then the, the high level psychological needs, um, how important is it to feel respect and to, to live with purpose? Um, and we asked about it for you and then for each of those different agents. Okay, so um, let me show you the results on this. So on the y-axis, you have the ratings of need importance from one to seven. And then on the x-axis, you have each of these different targets here. So first, um, the, the physiological needs, we weren't expecting to see any differences across any of the targets on these. So even the chimpanzee you know, has important physiological needs. As it turns out, the drug addict is a little bit different. Um, and that basically seems to represent some myopia about needs in the sense that people basically think drug addicts are you know, really obsessed with the need for drug beyond anything else. Um, so you know, that, that popped out surprisingly. And then uh, middle level needs are starting to see some distinction here. And then high level needs are the ones where you, you see the most distinction across the different targets. And this is very crowded, so I can just take those out for you. And so what you see in terms of this trajectory is that people do indeed think that like high level needs are most important to themselves, to their friends, um, to lawyers, you see, um, and relatively less so to chimpanzees. And so drug addicts and homeless people and even children, they're kind of more like the chimpanzee uh, than like the self in terms of people's perceptions of their high level needs, which we think tracks with perceptions of, of humanness. So it's sort of an implicit measure that kind of tracks with this. And so this you know, suggests the sort of spectrum of people's beliefs about the extent to which these targets are, are human. Okay, now um, what about peers, people within your own in-group? Oh, Kurt, do you have a question? Yeah, I have a, I have a question actually. Yeah. Um, it made me think of, of morality stuff. So it seems like people are dehumanizing kids, but it also seems that people protect kids the most of all from from harm, right? In some sense, they're like ultra human because we like really worry about them instead of like various animals, which we maybe wouldn't. So, can, is is that yeah, relevant? Let me let me speak to that definitely. So, I, I think this really kind of gets into these different forms of mind and and dehumanization, actually, which was a little deeper than I was you know, planning to go. But of course, there are these kind of two dimensions in the mind that I mentioned, the, the capacity for thought and the capacity for feeling. And so what we're finding for the, the beliefs about high level and low level needs is that it tracks very carefully with beliefs about the agency and the thought dimension. So, which, which is why, you know, the lawyer is seen as having, you know, usually seen as kind of competent, having these um, higher level needs. And then the child who is often seen as, you know, warm and you, you know, love your child, of course, but not particularly, not they have like, do not have deep mental capacity <laughs> um, in terms of their, their thoughtfulness. Um, and so they're seen as having the lower um, psychological needs. So this basically tracks with sort of one dimension of, of humanness and, and in terms of how that relates to morality, I don't think it would be sort of a one-to-one -one match because I think in terms of moral regard, people think about both um, the mental capacities for thought and feeling. You know, they really take the, the warmth dimension into account for that. And so that wouldn't be really depicted here. Um, Got so it, thanks. Thought, yeah, great question. Any other questions? I've, I've been talking quite a bit. We do have a question in the chat here. Um, Athalia, do you want to just unmute yourself and ask it? Um, sure. Um, so my question was, when you were talking about um, the what's more human, uh, and you were talking about like the what's less human and all of that, I wanted to see if there was any gender differences. Like, would women prioritize the safety of a child more so than men, or mm -hmm. do you have any research on that? Um, so we have looked at gender differences in these perceptions of needs, and we have not really found anything consistent that pops out there. Um, I will just to go back one project, and I know they're kind of different topics, but that one where you, we looked at talking to strangers, 
Um, we also looked at gender there, which was kind of fun. And we did find that um, when people have a choice about who they engage with, who they talk to, um, in particular, females are more likely to seek out other females. So, you know, maybe that feels safer to them or something. So there's that little selection that happens there. Um, but no, we didn't, we haven't seen like gender differences in terms of needs particularly, but I'll keep gender kind of in mind if you're interested in it as I go through the rest of the, the data. So Ramal, do you want to unmute yourself and ask it or? Yeah, sure. I can do that. Um, yeah, I was just wondering if you had ever implemented any research that looked at the dehumanization of prisoners, like in addition to the other characters that you already had people sort of judging. Yeah, we have looked at prisoners as a category and um, people uh, in terms of perceptions of needs, they see them just like homeless people, drug addicts. They're, they're very much in the same category. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Good question. Okay, James, I'd be curious to see how much social safeness worldview threat affects the train socialization study. Yeah, James, do you want to meet yourself and add to that at all or? Yeah, just uh, you mentioned that uh, extroversion acted as a moderator and I'd be curious to see if this uh, influenced it above and beyond extroversion. I wondered if you had done any studies on that. Yeah, it's such a good question. So let me actually just clarify the findings on extroversion. I just glossed over it so quickly. So what we find is that it moderates the predictions. So extroverts think that they will have a much more pleasant experience talking than introverts think. Um, there are some other personality characteristics that also moderate those predictions, um, like neuroticism <laughs> moderates as well, but it does not moderate the actual experiences. So in fact, what we find is that introverts have, they report having just as pleasant of an experience, just as positive of a time talking um, as extroverts do, sometimes even more so. And that's actually in line with other findings like Will Fleeson has studies where he makes introverts act extroverted for a week and, and you know, sees what happens to them. And they report that they have more happiness during that time. Although they also report that it's tiring. So I do think there might be some window upon which you know, that becomes exhausting. These aren't really necessarily long conversations. But James, back to your question about um, social safeness and worldview threat. Yeah, I, we haven't looked at that. I think it, it could very much kind of play into this. Um, one mechanism that we tested is that uh, what we just call negativity bias, that people might be imagining kind of the worst possible experience when they think about talking to a stranger, which might be tapping into this idea of like threat for your worldview or like safety, safeness. So if you, if you think, if I talk to a stranger on the train today, I'm gonna have a terrible experience because this person is going to, I don't know, like say something awful to me or hit on me or something, um, then you know, perhaps that could be driving those negative predictions. And we haven't found any evidence to suggest that's what people are thinking about. We, what we found is that, um, in fact, if you just ask people, like, imagine a conversation with a stranger, they basically imagine, like, pretty good conversations, um, pretty good conversations that are pretty interesting. They're not really thinking about, like, truly terrible conversations. So it, it's not about, like, thinking that the conversation is going to be bad so much. It's really more about thinking nobody really wants to talk to you. Like, I just don't think that people are going to want to engage with me. Um, and and what we call that is pluralistic ignorance, a form of pluralistic ignorance, which is that you perceive others' behaviors, like they have their headphones in and they're not making eye contact and you infer their attitudes based on those behaviors. So you then infer, okay, well, I assume that they don't want to talk. And in fact, maybe they're somewhat open to it, but they're just doing that because that's sort of the norm in this space. And so their, their behaviors really do more to the norm than a reflection of their attitude. Um, and so we think, you know, it's essentially a form of pluralistic ignorance that's, that's driving the, some of those results. Um, okay, there are a lot more questions. Um, should I keep taking some or do you want to go back to some of the slides? Um, I think we can go back to the slides. It's, it's, this is so exciting. All right, let's- I know, so, we'll see. Um, are there going to be more penises to be had? <laughs> uh, exciting new Zoom bombing will we endure? I love all these questions. You guys keep the questions coming in the chat. I'm gonna to try to get through a little bit more content. Um, if there is more exciting, I actually can't even screen share anymore, Kurt. <laughs> all right, there we go. Okay, if there are more exciting comments to be drawn on the slides, we can just jump off of them. Um, okay. Again, I can't. Well, there we go, I'll, I'll let you do one more time. Okay, thanks. Thanks everyone for your patience. 
Great. All right, so um, here we're looking at um, perceptions of peers in your own class. And uh, what you find anything above zero here means that you think the need is more important to yourself than it is to others. And so people do think even physiological needs are more important to them. That's you know, eating, drinking, sleeping, middle level needs a little bit more important to them. And certainly high level needs are more important to them than to the average um, person in their class. And this is true even if we call out a particular person, like what about Jake in your class? People still think you know, these things are more important to them than to that other person. And so this has you know, some interesting implications for how people might choose to incentivize others. Um, you know, the way people think about others' motives might choose how they, how they try to motivate them to do different things. And so you can think about extrinsic incentives versus intrinsic incentives. Extrinsic incentives might be things that could be seen more as satisfying lower level needs, like having job security, you know, safety. And then intrinsic incentives might be things that could be thought of as satisfying more of the high level needs, um, developing skills and, and abilities and, and doing something that feels good. Um, and so, so those things are tracking more at the high level needs. And so we would expect to kind of see a similar gap here. And that's exactly what we find when we ask people about an, an average student in their class, they say, oh, extrinsic incentives are more important to me, but especially intrinsic incentives are more important to me because they think of themselves as having more of these high level needs, all right? And so that has some, you know, interesting implications in terms of, you know, again, how people motivate and, and um, others in the workplace. We have a paper on this that I'm not gonna go into, but just showing that um, people feel somewhat objectified in their workplace um, in the sense that they think of themselves as like a cog in the machine and they really want more intrinsic incentives, more things that satisfy their high level needs that they, they report that they're sort of not getting. Um, so if you're curious about that, you can check out the paper. And Clifford, thanks for dropping that link into the chat. I'll take a look at that later. Um, okay, but so, so some questions that could be still remaining in your mind. Um, one of the ones that we had that we really wanted to investigate was, you know what, maybe, maybe there really is um, differences in the population in terms of people's needs. You know, perhaps uh, there are people like homeless people that um, actually would say themselves that the lower level needs are more important to them than the higher level needs. So that really changes a bit of the conclusion that we would make because then it would suggest that, you know, it's not so much dehumanization of, of, of homeless people, but like accuracy, like people are accurate in, in their beliefs that maybe homeless people actually don't really care about high level needs. And so we kind of wanted to get to the bottom of that to some extent. And so we partnered with a charity called respondnow.org and uh, they have an annual holiday gift drive that every single year, they, a lot of donors come and bring all sorts of goods like cans of food, as you can see depicted here. Um, and then they're matched with recipients who receive it. And so we surveyed the donors and the recipients about their beliefs about each other's needs. And so for the donors, we asked them um, and we cut down the scale quite a bit just to make this short and simple because we're literally handing out surveys at a charity drive. We asked them, how important is your own need for food? Uh, that's the low level need for love, that's the middle level need, and then for meaning, that's the high level need. All right, and then we asked them to predict recipients needs. How important is a typical charity recipient's need for food, for love, and for meaning? And then for recipients, we also asked them to rate their own needs and to predict donors' needs. So we also saw what recipients think about donors, which is interesting here. Okay, so um, let me show you what all the results look like. So we changed the scale. So it's like a one to 10 scale to make it more intuitive um, for participants. And so first we can look at donors ratings. And so, you know, no surprise here, they report that all of those needs are very important to them, um, every single one of them. Now they predict that recipients have much less uh, need for meaning. So you, here's the kind of the classic dehumanization uh, finding. Uh, now, what do recipients report? Do recipients also report that they actually don't care so much about meaning? Not at all. Recipients very much report, just like donors, that they do care about all of those needs the same amount. All right. And then what do recipients think about donors' needs? And um, we are really interested. Oh, so, so basically donors are not just dehumanizing recipients' needs, but actually mispredicting them. And then um, recipients actually predict uh, donors' needs um, pretty accurately. So then, you know, they're not perfect, but they're basically getting the pattern right. So recipients do recognize that donors have high level needs. It's just that donors don't recognize that recipients have high level needs. 
And we've also done this in terms of like rankings, which you know forces people to make choices, right? And, and even there you get sort of similar pattern of results, both donors and recipients rank meaning as the highest ranked thing uh, for both of them. So, um, okay. So uh, one potential you know, consequence of this that, that we've been looking at, the, at is um, what sorts of uh, gifts people would then give to try to satisfy the needs of recipients. So if they're misunderstanding what recipients needs are, maybe they tend to give things that aren't really fully satisfying like their high level needs. So um, we categorize, at least in the drive, we tried to take, you know, we attempted to examine this by sort of approximating across the types of goods. And one type of good that was very, very common was food. Anything related to food, cans of food, bags of rice and so on. And then there also was another type, um, which is sort of cash equivalents. So like gas cards, gift cards, things that have some flexibility. Um, now it's not, you know, cash is very loaded. There's a lot of, you know, things that make it different from food. But for the purposes here, one thing you could think about is that cash is more likely to be used as something that could satisfy either a low level need or a high level need. So it has kind of more flexibility in it. So um, what we looked at is, you know, what were the actual gifts donated and what did people want? All right. And so what we find is that um, this is donors reports and recipients reports. So donors report giving you know, more food than cash. Um, and I don't even know where the cash goes because none of the recipients that we surveyed reported getting any cash. They report getting you know, overwhelmingly basically just food. Um, and then what do recipients want? Is it the food that they want? No, <laughs> recipients. Recipients really want the money. They want the money. They do not want the food. Um, you know, maybe they just don't need another can of beans. Um, and then interestingly, donors actually do intuit this. So they do have some sense that recipients probably want the cash a little bit more. So there's something more going on here than just mispredicting their needs. And in fact, we actually think of this as a, you know, a form of paternalism. And so we have a separate paper, which I'm not going to present all the results to you, but I'll be basically just give you the bottom line, which is that um, we find that perceptions of a recipient's mental capacity determines how paternalistically you choose to help them. Um, and in particular, cash is seen as something that could be wasted, it could be used on drugs and alcohol and so on. And so the more that donors think, oh, this recipient you know, is not trustworthy, has weak mental capacities, the less interested they are in giving them cash in particular. Um, so you can find that in that paper if you're, if you're curious about that. Okay, and then the last topic um, that I would be remiss if I didn't cover is thinking about another example of everyday dehumanization in America going on right now, which is, you know, political polarization. And so, um, you know, I feel like Kurt and I have both given this type of talk so many times and you can look at any recent stats, you can look at Pew Research and just find that animosity towards um, the other side of, of the political viewpoint is increasing across time. Um, there are some studies that have recently come out that suggest, you know, animosity is at all time high levels in America um, since the Civil War, uh, which is, you know, quite disturbing. And so um, this is sort of goes hand in hand with dehumanization. And so a lot of practitioners are thinking now about, you know, are there ways in which we can reduce the levels of animosity, you know, in America, let's just say, how can we reduce dehumanization? And conversation has been put forth as a, a potential means by which to reduce dehumanization. That kind of fits with the, the contact theory that if you, you know, just have contact with the other side, um, then, you know, perhaps that will start to make you feel more positively inclined toward them. Um, and so you can look at all these organizations that have these quotes on their website saying like, here's how we're going to turn the tide of rising rancor, you know, we're going to have these conversations. Now, um, we know, however, that some forms of contact are negative and some forms of conversation can end up being quite antagonistic. So all you need to do is look on social media and you can, you know, find on Facebook some argument that's happening between people in which it doesn't really seem like contact uh, is, is improving dehumanization there. If anything, it's actually getting worse. Um, I'm not gonna read you this whole conversation. Um, and one of the things that we thought about in our research was that, you know, perhaps a key element here is that there are different ways in which a person can have a conversation with another person and they sort of bring different motives and goals to the table. Um, and, and in particular, there are different media by which you can converse. Right? So perhaps talking in person is very different from engaging online, you know, on social media. 
um, in a bunch of predictable ways. All right, and so intuitively we know this is true. Like we know from our own lives, this is the case, but we thought, you know, we're gonna try to look at this scientifically. And so um, what we did was we, um, we ran, <laughs> we wrote a bunch of papers on it, but I'll, I'll basically show you one experiment that kind of captures the paradigm. And that in this experiment, we, we go into a sample of participants. So let's take um, college students, like let's say at Berkeley, which, and so many of our samples recently have been run at Berkeley and we pre-select among that sample, what are the topics that people disagree about, All right? So Berkeley is very liberal, but they do have topics that they disagree about. For example, it turns out half of Berkeley students think drugs should just be full out legalized, all of them in the US. Um, the other half, you know, has slightly more nuanced views on it. Um, also, government reparations for slavery is a, a very controversial topic here. And um, back when, you know, like Ann Coulter was on the campus, there was some controversy around like who, who should be speaking on our campus. Um, so these are the topics that people felt strongly about and they had very different opinions about. And so we, we bring everyone into the lab. Uh, sometimes it's virtual, sometimes it's physically in the lab. And we have them tell us their opinions on these controversial topics. And um, we have them complete a filler task, a personality survey while we pair them based on strong disagreement around the topics. They then have a conversation and then they complete a post survey telling us their experiences. And so we're randomizing them if they're in the lab here at the session level. So we get you know, up to 20 people at a time coming in and then they're either put into, they're put into one of three conditions, either they're video chatting, they're speaking, or they are writing. Okay, and so before the conversation, here's how we measure their beliefs about the, the different topics. Um, and we, that's how we match them. We match them based on having different attitudes and they have to feel strongly about it. So they have to be at like a two on strength. Okay, um, right. And then during the conversation, we randomly assign them into those three conditions and we record the conversations uh, for research purposes, of course. So these are actual stills from the experiment. And then afterwards we ask them, okay, what, you know, what happened during those 10 minutes of conversation with someone that disagreed with you? And we ask them about their perceptions of their partner. So these are per perceptions of their partner's um, mental capacities. We ask about the extent to which they felt like they understood each other and conflict, how much conflict there was in the conversation. And then we also capture their attitude change afterwards. Okay, and so basically what you see is that um, in the video chatting and speaking conditions, um, there's no differences. So it didn't make a difference whether they were video chatting or whether they had the video off here in terms of how they thought about their partner's mental capacities. However, when they were writing to each other, even on the same platform, so we use Skype in this particular experiment, people reported that they thought of their partners as being a little less mentally capable. All right. They also felt like there was less understanding and they perceived that there was more conflict. Okay. Um, oh, and then if you look at attitude change, so anything above zero here means that they're moving in the direction of their partner's attitudes. So actually everybody was a little bit after 10 minutes, which is kind of amazing, but you see less of that in the writing condition and the writing condition participants at the end of the conversation are saying they still disagree overall. Um, whereas video chatting and speaking participants are actually saying, overall, I think we kind of agree. So they, they found common ground. All right. Okay. So um, we've run a whole bunch of series of experiments that have kind of found similar findings. And the, the prescription that comes out of it is, you know, fairly simple. It's like, all right, why are we, you know, having these conversations online? Let's see if we can get more people to talk via the phone. You know, not necessarily scalable, but for your own life, you might expect that people might, you know, adopt that. Um, but, you know, I would say before you say let's talk, don't forget where this whole talk, you know, presentation started, which is that people don't like to talk, all right? And they, they don't even want to talk to strangers at all, remember? Okay, so I'll just show you some data that shows that people don't anticipate that having a conversation over the phone or video chat or in person is any better than writing. They don't even recognize that, all right? So we ran a prediction experiment where we just, you know, basically say, imagine how this might go. And we've walked them through the exact, you know, actual experiment. You know, you enroll in this lab experiment, you answer a survey, reporting your opinions, you're matched on someone who disagrees with you. And we told them exactly how the matching process works. So they're not imagining something very different from the actual experiments. They're imagining, you know, exactly what the actual experiment was like. Um, you're going to talk with them for 10 minutes. And then we said, you know, imagine you have a choice between three different experimental conditions. You could video chat with them or you could speak with them. 
or you could write to them, what condition would you prefer to be in? Um, and so what people prefer is to be in the writing condition. <laughs> they wanna be writing to the other person. They do not wanna be speaking to that person. <laughs> Um, and so, you know, why is that? Um, well, they predict that the, there will be more understanding in the writing condition than the speaking and video chatting conditions. They think there will be actually less conflict. They think, you know, overall, they're just going to enjoy themselves a little bit more in that writing condition. So they are kind of mispredicting uh, the, 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 the way in which this conversation will go. Um, and I didn't put it side by side, but there's also just like a huge misprediction in terms of overall levels of understanding and conflict and so on. So that people are expecting that this will just be a much worse experience overall than what we actually see happening in the lab. Okay, so um, I will just summarize now. I've seen a lot of questions uh, happening in the chat, so we can still have a little bit of time for questions. Um, Indeed, I'm sure if you guys think about, you know, what are the, the moments in your life that were most important or maybe maybe made you happiest, often you'll be thinking about something that was, you know, either social or pro-social in nature. It's an important part of what makes us all human. Um, what I've argued in this work is that there are these psychological barriers to engagement. And um, they stem from this idea that we don't have direct access into other people's minds and particularly others that are more different from us. It becomes more and more challenging to, you know, really recognize the full extent of their mental capacities um, and know, you know, how to engage with them um, or how to, you know, help them. Um, so, you know, what basically my recommendation out of this is, you know, people are often kind of in their heads and they need to step out of their heads a little bit and think about um, sort of re-engagement um as a, a way of, of trying to overcome everyday dehumanization so whether it's you know actually talking to the person who disagrees with you as opposed to writing to them or you know having that conversation with the stranger that you wouldn't originally have had um, my work basically suggests that those things might be a little bit better than what you're expecting okay so um these are the people that worked with me on this nick Apley, peter Bellamy, adam waits jen abel and then if you um you know, we're only going to have about five minutes for questions. So if you want to like learn more or just reach out to me, my email is at jschroeder at berkeley.edu. And you can, of course, always go to like my website or um, check me out on Twitter. All right. Thank you all. This is great. And yeah, I'm seeing some silent laughs. <laughs> And I'm, I'm happy to answer, like, so we only do have like five minutes, but I'm happy to answer a couple of questions. Um, so Kurt, should I take them from the chat or should I give, like someone already has their virtual hand up, should I give like a virtual hand? Uh, the, I mean, you could wait through the chat. It's probably easiest to do virtual hand and then maybe um, folks who wrote in the chat can maybe email Juliana if they have pressing questions and, and then engage that way. Great. So I'm going to take the virtual hands first. If you really want your 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 chat comments to be answered, you can put up a virtual hand. So um, Tana Shree. Hi. Thank you so much. That was a great talk. Um, I, I'm not one of the students in the class. I'm actually I saw this post uh, on Kurt's Twitter. Uh, I'm a graduate student studying um, moral reasoning at UC San Diego with Adina Schachner. Um, and we're actually looking at um, how um, to bridge this conversation divide and address these like everyday dehumanization forms we can use things like music and showing that others are musical and stuff like that so that's just a little background i'm i'm curious you mean like, I, sorry you mean like others have similar musical preferences or something that kind no of just even showing like i don't know if you've seen anecdotally there's like a lot of stuff on prisoners and homeless people being able to produce music and how that's like changed people's attitudes and that kind oh, of stuff so that's that's, so that's what i study i'm a, I'm a music psychologist but wow. uh, my question is actually um I don't know if you, I'm, I'm sure you've seen like Harriet Over's work on um, um, just questioning these like dehumanization terminology. And so I'm wondering if you can just like respond a little bit to that and say like, is this something you think is just different from negative stereotypes and prejudice? Like do you like just, we're using the term dehumanization, but like, how do you think about it as being distinct from just like straight up, like just negative attitudes as opposed to like a lower mind? Oh, so, such an important question. So I actually was just reviewing an article that is attempting ambitiously to take on the kind of the dehumanization challenge in the literature. It's a very, very sort of thorny, hairy topic. So, so Harriet's basically point is that um, she, she doesn't think that there's evidence for the, the hypothesis that 
the more that you dehumanize another person, the more you think of them as lacking more regard and perpetrating violence upon them. And in fact, you know, I think I, I also agree, like when you think about everyday dehumanization, that's not necessarily going to be associated with violence. I'm actually saying that it's not antagonistic in nature. It can just be due to people's um, apathy. Like they just don't care enough to think about other people's minds. And so the term dehumanization is quite loaded. Um, and it's not the same as negativity, right? Because, you know, essentially what you're suggesting is that people believe others have um, weaker mental capacities, which um, some of that can be negative, but it also means things like you think that you experience more shame and more guilt and more, you know, you're more sensitive to all sorts of things that other people wouldn't be. And so that, you know, it's hard to say what's sort of positive and negative there. It's, it's, so it is a bit orthogonal to, to negative feel, although it's correlated, of course, in practice. Um, and, and I do think that this whole debate about, you know, does dehumanization always incite violence? I think that the term has become so broad at this point that you really can't say that that's the case anymore. I mean, that was sort of Bandura's original theory, like way back when. Um, and, and there certainly are types of dehumanization. I think you have to separate into the different types of dehumanization. So there's blatant dehumanization, which I think Nora gave a talk in this session. So I don't know if you mentioned that work, but um, you know that work I think has been very much associated with with unwillingness to commit violence against someone. Um, but the, the ways in which I measure it, it's really just like per perceptions of mind, which can be very subtle. I don't think would necessarily be associated. In fact, you know, if anything, the, the thing that makes this so interesting, I think, is that like take the donors, like they're trying to help recipients. Like they, they want to like, you know, make their lives better and improve their well-being. Like it's the exact opposite of trying to harm, but they're still sort of getting it wrong. Like they're still sort of missing the fact that they have these high level needs. Um, and so that's why I really kind of diverge from a lot of that kind of traditional dehumanization stuff. I probably shouldn't even be using the exact same term. Like I should probably use a different term, but um, I don't know. Like I, it's the literature is still figuring out like what should we call these different forms of dehumanization? Like you know, is it overt? Is it not overt? Is it every day? Is it blatant? And so kind of stay tuned if you're excited by this work, like keep following the literature because I think there are kind of theory papers out there now that are trying to kind of sort through these different questions. Cool, thank you so much. You're welcome. It's a great question. Look, Ju Juliana, maybe uh, Lindsay's question and then, um, sorry for Clifford and Farouk, maybe do it over email just to make sure we um, end on time. Great. Yeah. So Baruch and Clifford, I look forward to your emails. Clifford, I think you were writing a lot in the chat, so I look forward to your emails. And then uh, Lindsay, go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi. Uh, well, thank you for your talk. It was really great. Um, I was wondering, after you said that quote that Maslow said about like lower level people just like not wanting to get a job, like the unemployed leading to chronic unemployment or whatever, um, I was wondering like, is this kind of hierarchy of needs only applicable in a capitalist framework or is it is there any research on that like how does this translate to a different kind of economic system where people aren't systematically oppressed perhaps huh um interesting i don't know if it only applies within that framework what i think might be an interesting like research question would be you know are are some of these perceptions exacerbated within sort of a capitalist way of thinking? Um, uh, or, or on the kind of flip side of that, um, do these perceptions change a bit and become more bounded uh, within other types of things? Yeah, so that would be interesting to like see how it intersects. And so, you know, are people that like really believe in, in capitalism more likely to sort of dehumanize in the sense they don't sort of recognize the higher level needs of certain other individuals, like maybe individuals who aren't working or aren't producing. Um, I don't know the answer to that. I think it's a provocative and interesting question. Um, but I, so I think, you know, it's really a question for more, for more research. All right. Uh, thank you for that lovely talk, Juliana, and for uh, uh, being so um, flexible when we run into technical challenges. No You're a pro. I can tell you you teach in the B school where there's lots of like dynamic interactions. Oh so. yeah, this happens in the B school all the time. <laughs> <laughs> every day, every time I teach, it's like a penis on the slides. <laughs> Those MBAs, you know. Yes. Um, but it was lovely hearing uh, hearing your latest data and hearing it all stitched together. It's a it's a really compelling um, body of work.
Yeah, this is really fun. Thank you so much for inviting me. And it was great talking with all of you. So uh, stay tuned, everybody. Yay, Juliana. Um, for next week, where we have another talk. And um, for those of you who are in the class, um, seems like it's going really well. Uh, it was nice talking to some folks in uh, office hours the other day. And uh, we will see you next week. Thanks, everybody. Great. Bye.